Hello, Chart Watchers, and welcome to Market Watchers Live with Aaron Swenlin and to de- today, Arthur Hill. I'm your host, Aaron Swenlin. Today's show is being recorded, so you can play back any or all of our shows at your leisure. leisure. If you're unable to attend the show live, um, just go to stockcharts.com slash webinars and you'll get latest show there. Each show is archived on our site until the next show begins. But as I said, you can review older programs just by going to the Stock Charts YouTube channel or the Market Watchers Live Facebook page. During today's show, please feel free to submit ticker symbol requests, questions and comments using the chat window next to the video player. Later in today's show, Arthur will provide me stock symbols from your questions, and I'll use your requests in the 10 in 10 segment at 1250 Eastern Standard Time, where I'll attempt to annotate 10 stocks in 10 minutes. Uh, Keyword, attempt. (laughs) Market Watchers live show airs Monday through Friday from noon to 1.30. If you want to be part of the show, again, you can reach us via our chat room or Twitter at MKT Watchers Live, at MKT Watchers Live. And with that, I'd like to invite in Arthur Hill, my co-host for the day. How are you doing today, Arthur? Hello, Aaron. I'm doing very good. And yourself? Absolutely excellent. I'm always happy when I'm here at the show. So I do miss Tom. We always miss Tom, but I'm so glad you're here to join us. I know we have lots to cover. Absolutely. It's great to be here. Yes. So I'm going to have you feed me those symbols for the 10 and 10. And then I know you've got a great presentation for everybody. Uh, I Feel free, guys, to send in your questions in the live chat box, and we'll be sure to get those answered while Arthur is presenting or after he's finished. So Let's go ahead and take a look at some announcements here on our upcoming schedule. Friday, Tom is going to be doing a workshop on price support and resistance. You won't want to miss this. He is a short-term trader, so he he will give you a really great uh, instruction on how to find support and resistance and what to do with that as far as trading. Wednesday, Greg Chanel will be back, and he's going to do a point and figure review. So that should be a lot of fun. So today's agenda, what are we looking at? Uh, I'll be giving you those market updates on the hour. Again, as I said, Arthur Hill is here. Can't wait to see his presentation. Following that, we're going to have the 10 and 10 to 1. Microsoft is going to be the first one I will look at. So you can go ahead and look at that anytime uh, during the show. Take your notes and see what you think in comparison to what I think. And then finally, we're going to do a what would you do segment. And today, we're going to look at Ecolab, E-C-L. And we'll be asking you, what would you do? And I'll go into that more when we get to that. And then we'll finish up with, of course, mailbag and wrap up. Make sure that all your questions have been answered uh, uh, as far as Arthur is concerned and as far as just general questions uh, for the show. And with that, I'm going to get started with our first uh, market update. All right, we're going to go first of all to our candle glance screen here. And this will give us a a look at all of the major markets, minus just a few. So here we go. Uh, The Dow obviously on a straight path upward, uh, still making new all-time highs, intraday highs as well. We can see uh, S&P 500 had uh, reached some new highs, but it has pulled back somewhat. Uh, Looks like we've lost about half of the gains so far today with uh, the S&P falling back. NASDAQ, we did get a gap up, but it is starting to uh, consolidate, albeit very uh, volatilely. But uh, we can see that uh, it is up at this point in time. Russell 2000, we're seeing some Finally, seeing some positive action here out of the small caps. Love this flag formation. Love the breakout with another flagpole. Uh, looks like a great day for small caps. You can see the treasury yields are down somewhat, reading at 2389. UUP gap down this morning and has been consolidating mostly sideways. 
Uh, it is reading currently at 24.45. Commodities are lower, likely because we're seeing uh, oil. USO is down, although it did spend the, the first part of uh, the morning uh, just moving mostly sideways uh, back and forth over the last uh, yesterday's close. Gold, we can see, is did have a nice rally, but it pulled back. Good news is it, it is bouncing off of yesterday's close. So GLD reading at 118.26. Volatility index mostly unchanged right now. Still reading under 10 at 994. And advances are leading declines. Let's go and look at some headlines here from our member homepage. And the headlines are listed in our free to predefined alert section. So right now, pretty interesting. We can see, of course, the NYSE is doing quite well. Uh, Russell 2000, I just showed you, has crossed above 1525. S&P 500, as I noted, has set a new all-time high uh, intraday, as has the Dow. We're also seeing the healthcare sector getting more healthy. We also have a new high on the TSX. So I'm gonna go ahead and take you first to the Russell 2000 so you can get a, an idea of what we're seeing here as far as small caps. So it's a very nice breakout that we're seeing, but I would say we're still traveling within this symmetrical triangle pattern. It is a continuation pattern, so we should be expecting a move up. Nice bounce right off that 20-day EMA. You can see that the uh, PMO has bottomed and looks like it's ready to turn back up for a PMO buy signal. And this is all happening in near term oversold territory here. So I think that looks good for the small caps. The idea that we're looking at two bottoms uh, coming up here on the PMO I, that are rising in match for the price bottom. So I think uh, Russell 2000 small caps uh, are getting more healthy and we can expect more than likely higher prices coming in on the small caps. And with that, I'm going to conclude our first market update. And instead of turning it back to Tom, I'm going to go over a few uh, interesting economic reports. And you can find these on Bloomberg. This is where we go to get them. And we can see really the most important uh, report we're gonna get today is that uh, Fed meeting announcement. There's lots of talk about how they're gonna handle uh, interest rates uh, as what is expected is a 1.375% level uh, for the consensus. We'll have to see what they come in uh, with ultimately, but on average, we're looking at 1.375% as a target as far as the market is concerned. We already looked at the Russell 2000 and show you very quickly the SPY. Well, the S&P, let's just go to the S&P. And there you go, we can see making new highs here. We had that PMO buy signal quite a while ago at the end of November. And since then, we continue to see excellent uh, rallying. Uh, even when we pulled back, we're coming down and not even uh, touching that 20 day EMA. Look at the margin between the five, the 20, the 50, and especially the 50 and the 200 day EMA. We are in a strong bull market. There is no uh, question about that. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and bring in Arthur at this point. Uh, you know, what are you thinking about the market in general before you just get into into your presentation? I mean, when you look at a chart like this. Well, clearly a bull market. I mean, there's no other way to put it. And the overbought just well, I mean, overbought's really an overused term, isn't it? Yes. In this market. Yeah. Um, and it's it's probably uh, overused all the time in an uptrend. Probably the first time you hear overbought, that's probably a buy signal. Right. Uh, and until you hear overbought about 10 times, uh, then you're not going to, you know, you don't know when you're going to get a pullback. Right. Um, so, yes. and we're coming into the bullish seasonal period or we're in it right now. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Uh, Santa Claus uh, should be coming to town. Uh, as as they say, the Santa Claus rally. Uh, you know, here's the weekly chart. And again, you know, what I, I tell people a lot is the bull and bear market rules. And, you know, obviously we're in a strong bull market. And so we have to kind of uh, put overbought conditions on the side because when you're in such a strong bull market, you're going to get those overbought readings over and over and over again. And of course, 
eventually it's going to trigger. Eventually you'll probably get a pullback. Uh, but right now it's, it's hard to get uh, bearish on the markets. But with that, I'm going to have you uh, take that screen and go ahead and get started with your segment. Okie dokie. Let's get started. We're going to go to my browser window. There it is. And you should be seeing the Market Watchers Live 13 December 2017 slide. It's there. All right, great. So just a note before we get started on questions, um, I think it's best to ask questions that have more to do with the technique, uh, the method behind the madness, uh, instead of, um, well, sorry to say, I don't want to knock 10 and 10, but individual stock questions or individual security questions, because if you can learn the technique and the method behind the madness and the theory, that can help you in the future. And also, I'm going to be showing you some settings into in the um, indicators and charts that I'm showing today. And if you have any questions about those settings, feel free to ask. And I see somebody coming in on the chat saying overbought equals trending. And that is exactly what it is. Uh, overbought is a sign of a strong uptrend. So here are the topics. Obviously, you've read them by now. So I'll kind of just move into them. Uh, but before I get into the inflationary pressures, and the ratios that I'm going to show you. Uh, this subject was triggered by John Murphy. And I was noticing that he wrote that the PPI, or I noticed in the news, the PPI had a big surge on its latest reported value. I don't follow economic indicators too much, uh, but I wondered, you know, what was going on with inflation. And so I wanted to search John Murphy's articles. And so if you want to know what John Murphy's been writing at about a particular subject, you can go up to the search box at the top right. I typed inflation and John and Murphy. And by putting and there, I'm requiring all three terms to be in my search results. And then I click that little hourglass or hourglass magnifying glass to start the search. And then we will see the results pop up. So you might not see the articles at the top right away, what you need to do is click the articles tab there. So when I click that tab, I get all the articles by John Murphy where he mentioned inflation. And look at that, November 27th and December 12th. And so uh, two months ago, two weeks ago, John Murphy was already start, starting to talk about tips and showing signs of inflationary pressures and he's talking about it again with the producer price index. And so I wanted to build on that a little bit by charting some ratios to see what they show. And this will kind of dovetail in nicely with what John Murphy was showing us. So uh, TIPS, the TIP ETF, is based on the TIPS bonds, which are inflation protected. And so that means if there is inflation, then that will be adjusted in the bond and it will pay out a higher rate based on the inflation. So you're not going to lose your um, return just because of inflation. And if you look at this, the top indicator shows unadjusted tip. And as you see at the top left, I've got underscore tip for my symbol. And when you put an underscore before the symbol, it gives you the unadjusted data. And you can see if you had bought TIP, say, in April 2014, or that's probably May, June, and you held it on a capital appreciation basis, you'd be flat. You wouldn't have anything to show. All right. But if you look at the total return TIP, which is the next window, that's the red line, you can see that with the coupons and the distributions you get with this ETF, you would have had a small gain, basically. That's the total return for TIP, right? And this is the capital appreciation based on the price of the underlying. So in order to measure inflationary pressures, I was going to put these ratios together. This is the TIP TLT ratio, which is the 20 plus year bond ETF. It's not inflation adjusted. 
And then we have the TIP IEF ratio, which is a seven to 10 year bond ETF. And the TIP IEI ratio, which is a three to seven year bond ratio. And you're like, well, which one really matters? And I was wondering that too. And so in order to figure out which one is best for comparison, we need to know which bonds TIP holds. And in order to do that, we have to do a little search in our Google. So I just went to my Google. I searched iShares TIP Holdings, and I clicked that link, and it took me to the iShares website. All right, and there you can see all the details, portfolio here. And we can go down, and there's a link for maturity. And I can see the exposure breakdowns. And look at the biggest maturity group, seven to 10 years. I guess if you added these uh, three to fives, they would be close to about the same as well. So three to seven or seven to 10 seem to be the biggest holdings in the tips, more than 20 plus, definitely. So we should probably be comparing the tip ETF to the seven to 10 year bond ETF and the three to seven year bond ETF. And so we see when tip is underperforming, that tells you that inflationary pressures are diminishing. And then when tip starts outperforming a normal bond, that tells you that inflationary pressures are increasing. And so they've pretty much been increasing since the early part of 2016. And the same with the tip ratio to the three to seven year treasury bond ETF. So what does that mean if inflationary pressures are increasing? Well, it probably means that the Fed is going to be pressed to raise rates. And the Fed just happens to have a meeting today. So I wanted to take this one step further and look at some economic indicators. And I'm not going to show a bunch. But if you want to chart economic indicators at stock charts, you can go crazy. Uh, again, I'm going to use the symbol search there at the top. And all the economic sim symbols begin with the double dollar. So I just put in double dollar and I push enter to do the search. And again, up here, I have to filter that further. I'm going to click symbol, symbols. And there you'll see all the economic indicators that we cover. So that's just if you know, you don't have enough to do with your charting as it is already and you want some more work, you can look at those economic indicators. So I'm going to look at CPI and PPI. And what I've done is I've got the tip IEF ratio here at the top. And then I've got the CPI, the 12 month rate of change for the CPI and the 12 month rate of change for the PPI, the producer price index. Now I know there's all kinds of debates about the validity of these as far as inflation, blah, blah, blah. But you know, I don't have anything better to go on right now. So I'm going to just go with these. And, and you can see that the CPI, sorry, the tip IEF ratio rose, basically when the CPI rate of change rose and the PPI rate of change rose. And you can see all three falling together. And now all three are rising together. So we're seeing a little bit of inflationary pressure coming from the CPI, the PPI, and that is reflected in the tip IEF ratio. So this is something we might want to consider in our 2018 strategy if we're, you know, looking for not trades, but investments. And the first thing that this is going to affect is going to be the bond market. And so we're going to look at the treasury bond ETFs because they're at a moment of truth. They've like been at a moment of truth for over a month, it seems. I have to agree with just, that. <laughs> yeah. Um, so we've got IEF and TLT here on one chart for easy comparisons. Sorry about that little jump there. Okay. So basically we had this huge swoon in 2016 and then we had the big advance, but it fell well short of this prior high. And then we broke down, broke the wedge. And now we're consolidating with a triangle. 
So a consolidation after a breakdown to me seems like a, a bearish continuation pattern. And if we break support here, that argues for continuation lower in treasury bonds. And this high here from October is kind of like the line in the sand. If we break 106.6, then we have to reassess our more my bearish outlook here. And the bottom window shows the 10. Well, Arthur, we can't hear you. Hopefully we will get him back shortly. Appreciate everybody's patience. Yeah, feel free to start adding those questions into the question box. Uh, I have a few that I'm saving for his for him after his presentation. So uh, feel free, I'm collecting them as we go. Hopefully we'll see him back shortly. Um, we've been having some connection problems with some of our guests, so. All right, well, until he gets back, I'm gonna go ahead and uh, look at a few interesting things in the market. Uh-oh, let's get here. All right. Yeah, it looks like we've he's signed out, but we'll be back with him shortly. So, all right. So we were looking at the S and P. I'm going to go back to our member page. All right, because I wanted to look a little bit at our scooter rankings. Um, as far as our DP signals are going, and I explained this uh, last Friday on how to read the trend model signals. Short term is your five and 20 day EMA crossovers, if you remember. Midterm, intermediate term is your 20, 50 day EMA crossovers. And the long term are 50, 200 day EMA crossovers. The date below, that tells you when the signal came in. So, you know, we're looking at 2016, uh, April, when we got that 50, 200 day positive crossover. So that tells you how strong this bull market is. And we've just kept going and going and going. The only one of these that has a different signal, and Arthur, when you do get in here, feel free to just cut me off. One of the only signals that's red, there's that, and not on the S&P 100. The only one we have right now is on the NASDAQ. Momentum has been uh, shaky at best, and I think that this uh, November 29th signal that came in on the PMO is a good indication of that. Let me go ahead and I'm gonna take you to my actual chart for this because I wanna show you one that's annotated. All of these uh, charts uh, that you can see in this summary are located in the Decision Point Live chart list. You can get to that simply by clicking on the blogs, opening the Decision Point blog, and the link is right at the top of the De Decision Point blog and you'll find all of these. I try to keep them updated as far as annotations, but I admittedly, uh, the, the major ones are the ones that I look at more often uh, in comparison to the mid caps and small caps. So let's go ahead and look at that daily chart because I want to show you the PMO sell signal and how far we still have to go before we're going to see that PMO buy signal. You know, I've been watching this. I was thinking we might end up with a short term head and shoulders, but we're now starting to compete with what would be the head for the NASDAQ 100. And given we're seeing those breakouts uh, pretty much across the board on these uh, large cap stocks, I'll show you right here. You know, look at that beautiful breakout from that ascending triangle on the, o and, on the OEX. Got that buy signal. Definitely a much different picture than the NASDAQ 100. And again, it speaks to the fact that we have had issues with technology and a, um, as they say, bifurcated market. You know, we tech, tech just completely lost favor at the end of November. And we're now seeing the seeds that have been sown from that. Now, when I look at the chart, the NASDAQ weekly chart, so this is the NASDAQ weekly chart. This is where my intermediate term PMO signal, the middle of the bottom row on the, the DP uh, alert. Uh, so we can see 
that, you know, the NASDAQ was still in its bearish configuration. We got this uh, bullish conclusion to a bearish pattern. I always like to see that. I, th I find that especially bullish. We did end up with this pullback right when we started to hit the uh, all-time highs on the NASDAQ 100. But what we can see here is, you know, we got some improvement on the PMO on the daily chart, but we're now seeing a bottom above the signal line. And that is ex just extraordinarily good when you think about the fact that uh, the NASDAQ is having such problems. I like to see that change in intermediate term momentum. That tells me that on the daily chart, that this momentum change has uh, some intermediate term implica implications. So we're seeing on both the short term and intermediate term charts, momentum has turned positive for the NASDAQ 100. So rather than what could have been a textbook head and shoulders, we're now starting to, uh, ex what I would expect is a breakout to new all time highs. NASDAQ 100 is, is gonna follow suit uh, in my personal opinion. All right. I think it should. I'm back. Yay. Okay, cool. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, oh, it's always a chart to show. Everybody always has a, a question. So there you go. Uh, let's see. Is that yours or mine? There you go. Now it's yours. Okay. We're back on. Sorry about that. We had about uh, six inches of snow on Monday and three inches on Tuesday, and it's all melting today, and it's slushy, and maybe that has messed up the internet a little bit. So we're back with the uh, IEF and the TLT chart, and, and basically looking for this triangle to resolve here. My bet is down, but you know, you never know. It could break out to the upside, so we have to wait for that break. And then with the 10-year Treasury yield, the odds or my bet is on a break to the upside, higher rates. And if we break down to the downside, then we have to reevaluate. So uh, here's TLT. Now, this is the weird thing, and I'll show this uh, in more detail on the daily chart. You know, whereas IEF has been flat. TLT has been edging higher here and, and remains in an uptrend. It's in an uptrend for the past year. And then you look at the 30-year yield, and, and it looks like it's poised to break down here and move to new lows. So the 30-year and the 10-year are not on the same page. And the big move that we've had in rates has been at the short end of the curve. Two-year yields are at uh, multi-year highs. So here's IEF and TLT on a daily chart to put that into the detail with the more granularity. And there's that triangle. And we're bouncing a little bit off the triangle, but, you know, today's Fed day. So who knows what's going to happen uh, with the Fed? You know, you're going to get all kinds of whipsaws. You're probably best uh, waiting to see what happens tomorrow morning or even after the open uh, to see what happens when the smarter money, money comes in after the open. Yeah, you know, and somebody you, was, I'm sorry, somebody was asking um, what, if you could verify the validity of when the Fed raises rates, uh, does that always mean lower bond prices? Um, but, but rate increases can widen on the two to 10 year spread, which is good for financials. And that backs up to a question that uh, s someone was asking, so is this a good time to, you know, get into X XLF and the financials? Uh, as long as, as I think if we get this breakout, uh, breakdown actually in bonds, then I think it'll be good for XLF. I'd have to call up that chart. There's Ecolab that was just in there. Uh, but when you look at XLF, it, it's clearly a leader. Uh, yeah, it's a bit overbought for my taste. Uh, I'm more of a mean reversion kind of guy. And, you know, down here's when XLF was interesting before it made this move. Uh, now kind of, you know, maybe a pullback to that 27 area would make it more interesting from my perspective. So, um, so TLT continues to rise and until TLT breaks 124, I don't think we have that definitive move down in the bond market that is needed to keep this rally going in financials. So that's what I'll be watching uh, going forward here. 
So let's look at the correlation. So if treasury yields rise or fall, how's it going to affect other assets, say gold, uh, treasury bond, gold, treasury bond, of course, treasury bonds, but gold stocks, the finance sector, utilities, REITs, and so what, so forth. And what we need to do is create correlation coefficients. And here's a chart with a 10-year yield at the top. And then I've got gold, oil, and the dollar for the first correlation coefficients. And I'll go ahead and click on this chart so you can see the settings here. So if you look at the bottom here, I basically got the correlation with gold, and I've got 13 week. And then I added an exponential moving average of a 13 week to smooth it out a little bit better. You know, this is just to get the general idea of the relationship between two assets. You don't trade on this as far as, you know, signals are concerned. You just get an idea of, of is this a positive or a negative influence? And I colored it red if I thought it was a negative influence and green if it was a positive and blue if it was neutral. And then I added a little date time access in between these indicators to kind of separate them on the chart as you see here. So when we look at this, if the 10-year uh, the yield is negatively correlated with gold, so that means if yields rise, gold is going to be negatively affected most likely. It's going to go lower. So if this 10-year breaks above 2.5%, then gold's going to move lower because of negative correlation. Oil is mostly positively correlated with the 10 year. So that means if the 10 year moves up, oil typically moves up. And that would make sense because if 10 year is moving up, it would mean the economy is improving. Uh, it also suggests that maybe there are inflationary pressures and that could kind of be the self-fulfilling prophecy. Oil goes up and that creates inflation and so yields go up. Uh, the dollar, a bit of a mixed bag, kind of hard to tell, you know, negative in 11, 12 and 13. And then, sorry, and then a little bit positive and then negative again, a little bit positive. It's basically been mostly positive since the middle, latter part of 2015. And then the Nikkei, look at that, a strong positive correlation to the 10-year. Oh, don't tell me. <laughs> Am I off again? No, you're doing good. <laughs> I'm we still there. Yes, okay. you're still here. It's just we <laughs> can't see your pointer, so I don't know. Um I'm not sure exactly the, how you can fix that, but. No, you don't see the green pointer. No. Okay. So I'll do a new share. Uh, okay, I might want to did. share your desktop because I think that will get it back there. Bear with us as we do a little bit of our technical um, checking here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. Do you see a pointer? Let's see. Yes, we have your circle. All right. Excellent. Okay, great. Thank you very much for that technical help from our support desk. Okay, so I'll go back to my scroll here and we'll look at the view all. And then the second page is where those correlation charts are. So the next group for the 10 year yield would be financials. And look at this, six years of nowhere in the 10-year yield. What a frustrating trade. All right, there's a little rough regression channel. That middle line is a linear regression. And the outer lines are equidistant based on the furthest high or low, which would be this low right here, I believe. And again, it kind of shows that downtrend. And we need to break above 2.5% to get an uptrend going again in the 10 year. And if that happens, it's a positive for the finance sector, clearly strong, positive correlation. Same with the equal weight finance sector, strong, positive correlation. Sorry about that. That was a inadvertent click. <laughs> Regional banks, a very strong positive correlation, brokers strong, and insurance. So pretty much anything in the finance sector is positively affected by rising treasury yields at this stage. 
All right. Now we're going to branch out to some other groups and look at utilities, REITs, and staples. And look at utilities, mostly negatively affected. So if treasury yields move higher, then you would expect utilities to move lower. If REITs, if treasury yields move higher, you'd also expect REITs to move lower because they're negatively correlated. And you get these weird periods where you get some brief positive correlation. It's, it's not a perfect indicator. There's no such thing. Staples as well, uh, mostly negatively correlated. And gold, again, mostly negatively correlated. So what a difference a month makes. And I'll take this opportunity. Somebody's asking me about the PPO 5200 zero that I show on my charts. And I'll just explain that. There's the PPO. Um, Arthur, are you still there? <laughs> Oh, my goodness. It's just going to be one of those days. And you'll see that the PPO is, this is XLF. So it's positive when the 50-day EMA is above the 200-day EMA. And you can see the further it is above, the further or more positive the PPO is. And I don't look at divergences for these indicators. I pretty much rarely use divergences especially if you get a negative divergence and a new high, I, I pretty much ignore it because I like to see, you know, the bigger trend at work and the bigger trend is up if you have a new high. So there's no sense looking at a negative divergence. So this next segment is what a difference a month makes. And we're going to go back to an article on don't ignore this chart. And I'll get a refresh here. So I put this out today. And I was showing the difference in performance between the nine equal weight sector ETFs. And I think it's important, if you want to know how the sector as a whole is doing, you need to look at the equal weight sectors because they weigh every single stock relatively the same. Whereas ETFs like XLE, Energy, ExxonMobil, and Chevron account for 40% of the ETF. Uh, basic materials. Dow DuPont counts for like 25%, I think, of the ETF. Whereas if you look at the equal weight version, ExxonMobil and Chevron are just normal stocks in those. So it's a good overview of the sector. So here's sector performance from the 12th of October to the 10th of November. 22 trading days are a month. And you can see consumer discretionary was weak, finance was weak, technology strong, energy strong, industrials week, and the purple one would be healthcare week. So those were the leaders and the laggards then. And if we flash forward to the most recent 22 days, we've had a flip, literally. You can see consumer discretionary and finance are the leaders, up more than 7% in 22 trading days. Hey, Arthur? Can, yes. It looks like... Um... I don't know. It looks like we're not uh, getting you to come through on live stream. I, I think we'll have our producer who's probably already in the background working this very, <laughs> very hard. Um, oh, I must have faded out again, but you. Um, okay. Now it's moving. Okay. We're good now. You have my screen. Yes. Okay. All right. There we are. All right. Sorry about the interruption. So, so basically the top chart shows the performance the previous month, October 10th to November 10th. And the bottom chart shows the next month, November 10th to December 12th and how things have changed. So technology went from leader to laggard, but you know, it's not down. Technology is just flat. So that didn't tell me there was a lot of selling pressure in technology. Sure. Semis are down. But other things like networking are up and software are doing fine still. And then you look at industrials, a big move, and they were down the previous month. And energy is down this month. And consumer staples had a big advance, and they were not up very much. And healthcare was down, and healthcare is now up. So the leadership role has really changed over the past month. 
So I think that bodes well for finance. You know, the only challenge is finance is, <laughs> and there I am using that word I said was used too much, overbought. So now I want to look at a, a bunch of stocks uh, that I put together that I thought had interesting uh, chart patterns and interesting setups. And I'll do a refresh so we have an up-to-date chart with some of today's price action. But we've been seeing some uh, movement in metals. Uh, aluminum fell back recently. But, you know, looking at Century Aluminum, this looks like a pretty big uptrend here. And the 50-day came right down to the 200-day. And look, the stock surged off support back above both those moving averages, EMAs. So it looks like Century Aluminum wants to resume its uptrend. And this is a bigger uptrend here. And don't worry, I've got one that looked just like this that failed miserably. And I will include that because not all of these are sure winners. There's no such thing as a sure winner. The best thing we can do is have a portfolio that is fairly uh, diversified with, you know, at least 20 positions to buffer any losses that happen. So this next two come from the potash group. That would be Agrium, Agrium, A-G-U. That looks like a big surge and a flat flag and a breakout. So this one looks like it wants to move higher. Now, I said I don't use uh, divergences very often, but I do use them when they are in harmony with, I, with what I think is the bigger trend. So I think, you know, the 50-day EMA is above the 200-day. So I think the bigger trend is up here. And then you can see RSI touched 30 here in mid-November and held above there. So that's a slight positive divergence. And you can see the close here was lower. And that would have been the early warning, you know, getting that surge off support and getting it before the breakout. Just something for a lesson to consider in the future. Here's a potash from Saskatchewan and a similar pattern here with a flag and a breakout. Those breakouts are, are very impressive to me. Yeah, and it's inter it's good to see both of them uh, doing it together. The group is moving. Mm -hmm. So here's United Dominion Realty Trust. And, you know, I probably wouldn't have put that on if I'd known it was a REIT. Um, I was doing it kind of fast, and I thought it was United Dominion, the trucking company. Uh, so always know which sector your stock is in. But regardless, you know, there's an uptrend here. There's a triangle. There's a breakout. A uh, bit of a flag working here, but we need to get a breakout here. And as I pointed out before, if treasury yields move up, that would be negative for REITs and utilities. So that's something to consider. And we'll scroll down at some point here to the next one, Apple. Apple has a bull flag working here. Uh, and, you know, it had this big surge January to April, and then it just started on a slower uptrend. And the breakout here, we're holding above the breakout with what looks like a bull flag. And this here points out something uh, that I learned from Cesar Alvarez, and he helps me with some of my mean reversion systems. Um, he put a post-it on his computer to, saw, to say, buy ugly charts. And what he meant by that was, here's Apple. Look at this decline in September. You're like, oh, my God, it broke the 50-day. Oh, my God, RSI is below 30. That's looking ugly at 150. Well, that kind of marked the bottom when it was oversold. And the key when you're looking at overbought and oversold is you want to look at oversold when the trend is up. And you want to ignore overbought when the trend is up, all right? You're interested in oversold conditions because that tells you you've had a pullback within the uptrend. Yeah, and I know a lot of people um, don't understand that a lot of they are, some of these are oscillators, which means they have to they have to oscillate. So even if you're in a trend, you're you can a lot of times see uh, your indicators get oversold in a strong bull market because 
your indicators have to oscillate. <laughs> so if they're oscillating. Yeah, it depends on the, the time frame as well. This is, uh, you know, so I'm using 10 period RSI. Mm -hmm. If I was using 14 period, there would be fewer overbought and oversold readings. Mm -hmm. So if you're not getting enough readings, you might have to tweak your uh, RSI. Um, this is Oracle. Now it hasn't done anything since June, but uh, holding support 50 days above the 200 day and look at that surge off support. So it looks like Oracle wants to do something here. And next up, we have a group of pharmaceuticals because as Aaron noted at the beginning, healthcare is looking more and more healthy. Uh, XLV has had a nice move. And so these next charts are going to highlight some of the, um, bigger pharmaceutical names. We have Bristol Myers. So I try to be disciplined in my approach and you, you make your rules and I say, okay, I'm not going to look at anything on the long side if it's in a long-term downtrend. Now, sometimes I do break those rules, but for the most part, if the 50 day EMA is below the 200 day EMA, I don't even look at it. And I just say pass, you know, there's something better to be found out there. And so when the 50-day EMA is above the 200-day EMA, in general, you have an uptrend. And you can see Bristol-Myers hit a new high here in September, fell back, bouncing off support and turning back up. Oh, look, it was oversold right there at that bottom too. You know, all these signals look great in hindsight. I was just going to say, <laughs> <laughs> I always point out, oh, and see the PMO called that one. Course. Yeah, the HSI, the hindsight indicator. Exactly. So here's Laboratory Corp of America. And I've highlighted this a couple times in Arch charts uh, because I was eyeing this pullback here. And now we've got the breakout and we got a consolidation after this breakout. And I think this is just a consolidation after that big surge there. And I think this one is heading higher. And you can see it didn't become oversold. Doesn't always, you know, become oversold. Uh, here's Lily. Lily's popped already. Uh, Lily was highlighted in arch charts as well. But, you know, look at this sharp decline. It came oversold. And then even if you don't like to catch the falling knife, it stalled here and then it gave you that little break out there. And now it's at a 52-week high. So somebody says 20 positions, is that your standard practice? Uh, in general, I try to keep it to around 5% per position. Uh, it fluctuates, you know, sometimes I'll have higher cash levels. Uh, but in general, I try to keep it to 20 positions. It's hard to manage uh, any more than that. And when it comes to stocks, you don't get any diversification benefit once you get past more than 20 positions. Yeah, and uh, I, Pfizer. I have to wonder how many Tom has. Uh, he's he is so short term and uh, in and out, but I I don't think he has twenty. <laughs> I think he he trades uh, shorter term on and uh, fewer, but I'll have to ask him that. In yeah, yeah, that's a good question. Uh, what what size portfolio do you like to run? Right, because you know we need to set that in the beginning. You have to have a a target, you know, that you're trying to fill. Yeah. And I, so, I know for me, I trade a lot of ETFs just because I, I feel like that gives me the less volatility in some cases. I mean, there's certainly some ETFs out there that are pretty volatile, but, you know, as far as spiders and um, actually, I, I do like the equal weight versions of a lot of the uh, spider spiders. Well, it's true. Then, then you don't have single stock risk. Exactly. When you have an ETF. I mean, geez. You know, if you're going to trade individual biotechs, you really have to have a strong stomach. Mm -hmm. But if you trade the IBB or the XBI, that's different. Exactly. Well, I'm going to let you uh, finish this chart and then we probably should get into the 10 and 10 and see if I can't act, if I can actually do it in 10 minutes. <laughs> sure. Okay, great. Here is uh, Pfizer and it's hitting a 52 week high. So this is one of the bigger components in uh, XLV. And again, look at the ugliness of that break below the 50-day. And this is another thing. In, in an uptrend, 
when the 50-day EMA is above the 200-day EMA, when it moves below the 50-day EMA, that's when you need to put your ears up and be on alert for a potential reversal. Now, it doesn't happen all the time. You look at April, it didn't work out so well, uh, but it worked out better here in June, July, and August, and now it's working out here. So with that, we can move to 10 and 10 for Aaron. Yes, let me go ahead and get that screen set up for us. And the first one I did say that we would cover was, um, let's see, Microsoft. So let me get on that one right now. Okay. And there's that lovely article. Okay, let's, let's hit this. Okay, MSFT, Microsoft. Yeah, I thought this one was interesting because we did start to see a breakout on it. So I wanted to, to go ahead and annotate that for you. All right, so uh, I'm going to get the auto support resistance. And there we go. So I love that. I love seeing that breakout. I think that was uh, great. You got that bounce off the 50-day EMA. Uh, which is also good. And now we're starting to hold that support after having that breakout. Uh, and look at the PMO. We've got a really nice PMO going right here. Um, it, it It's bottomed. Again, this, these are different ways to get to your, I have some of these saved. So you can see I have a couple of these that are uh, not as opaque. So you can see through them. Uh, and that's how I, I do that. So all you do is pick your color, slide your rule there, and then it remembers what you've used. So I don't know if anybody, but he was actually familiar with that, but I wanted to show that. So we've got a PMO rising here. It's not quite had its crossover. Look at volume, the OBV looking really nice. I mean, in the thumbnail, that's really what you want to see. And then we have a scooter in that hot zone. So combining these, I think Microsoft looks pretty good right now. I would just be watching closely uh, what's going to happen in techs in general, but it does seem like they're ready to break out at this point. So that is the first one. And let me... All right, that way I'll have it all ready to add to the chart list. So we're going directly in there. Okay, so what would be my next symbol? All right, how about control, C-T-R-L? That'd be staying in the tech space. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. No problem. I when I look at these charts, um, you know, as far as the ten and ten, and I'm I don't know about Tom exactly, but I'm really paying attention to a lot of chart patterns. That's what I'm looking for, and I I am looking at most of these in a a shorter term rather than a uh, I mean I'm sorry in a little bit more of an intermediate term than a shorter term. That's because that's how I trade. So. Uh, all right, so right here, I think you could make a case. We have this nice area of support developing here. The only thing that would worry me would be a possible head and shoulders forming. But remember, I saw that on the NASDAQ 100. It pretty much fell apart as uh, price did get up to the previous all-time highs. And when I look at this PMO, again, I think this is um, something I would annotate. And yes, we're on that sell signal, but we're now starting to get into that oversold area. We're getting the bounce. Uh, it's coming in really just about on that 50-day EMA. I really hope to see this uh, hold some support and break out at least above the 20-day EMA. I think that would be a, a great sign. And then we would likely see this PMO turning up. So we're getting a little bit of deceleration, but I like the fact that it, it honestly is oversold. And look at the scooter ranking sitting near the top of the list. And uh, while the OBV doesn't look great, you know, I think uh, there's certainly something to be interested in here. Would you, um, sorry, to go back to Microsoft, would you have any idea of, of what you would use for a stop on that? Uh, okay, well, let's go back and see. Sorry to put you on the spot there. Oh, I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> All right, so actually, let me go back here and find it where I already annotated it. Yeah, we'll definitely not get through this in 10 minutes if we go this direction, but I'm totally fine with that. All right, so as far as a stop, yeah, that's a, a great question. I'm going to bring in the annotation again so I can look at this. So for me, I, 
again, we're looking at how long, long your trade's going to be. But I look at this and, you know, Arthur, if you agree or disagree, it's fine. But I would be looking at this uh, gap support here. And so if I lost gap support and granted it was lost here and then we did get that rally, but we got the bounce off the 50 day. So it would keep me interested, keep me interested on the watch list. But honestly, the sh in a shorter term investment, I would likely put my stop here pretty tight. Uh, I usually use fairly tight stops on my short term trades. That's just how I do it. Uh, and I, I typically will pick something just above where that line of support is, just so I'm the one who gets out before everybody else when they set their stop at, at $82. Um, I don't know if it really helps, but that's just my mentality. So anyway, that would be my stop there. Now, if I was looking for more of a buy and hold, I would probably bring uh, my stop lower. Uh, I want to, it's a buy and hold. So I need to tolerate a, a little bit more on the downside uh, in the, you know, in the hopes you're going to end up ultimately with a rally like we're seeing here. So that would be my thought. Yeah, I think that support level there at 80 is pretty valid. Uh, you know, right. if you close below that, then you'd have to reassess the overall trend if you uh, broke that low. Right. And and we should get, you would get uh, some warning because the 50-day EMA is now halfway between those two areas. So you could you would start to see whether the 50-day EMA was going to hold up as, as support as it rose. So interesting okay the next one would be square sq another tech all righty yeah we get a lot of requests for this one um, oh, okay yeah i don't pay i don't pay that close of attention honestly when tom is doing his spiel because i'm looking at the charts for the next you know one uh to, to talk about so uh, this one, the first thing I notice, and I'm going to use the parabola tool because this really has the, the feel of a um, parabolic move. And so that, that would always worry me. I would, as we've started on this rally, I would be setting a trailing stop because for parabolas, that's my, um, you know, typically, and you can see it right here. When you get the breakdown out of a parabola, it is a difficult and very quick breakdown. I mean, that's just textbook. You see it all the time on these. Um, so now I guess the question is, all right, well, are, have we found that area of support? You know, we're holding on to that 50-day EMA, but look at the 20-day. It can't seem to get back above that 20-day EMA. I'm still looking at a, okay, so I'm going to actually mark these. There we go. So Actually, let's use an arrow tool. There we go. So, yeah, I would be looking at the fact that, you know, we've held the 50-day, but we're not able to get above that 20-day. I'm not seeing any positive, uh, a positive look yet on the PMO. So yeah, I would be watching that 50-day EMA. If I was still holding it after this parabolic move, I'd watch the 50-day EMA. I'd probably set my stop just below it. Uh, you know, it looks like a, a pattern where we're getting some consolidation and could come off of that. Um, I just, I would be shying away from anything that's been in a parabolic or could start another one. I mean, it, it's great to get in on those parabolics. You know, typically I, I luck into them. You know, the PMO looks good. I get in and then all of a sudden, oh my gosh, it's, it's taken off. All right. So let's yeah, especially with techs uh, softening in general a little bit here. Mm-hmm. And I, I uh, the, the, the next one would be, uh, oh, you want to do Intel? Uh, no, I was just going to, yeah, I was just showing, I'd written about a parabolic on Intel. You know, in this case, we didn't get a, a harsh decline out of that para, uh, parabola, but we still got a decline nonetheless. So, okay, go ahead. Uh, the next one would be UFS, mm -hmm. Domtar Corp. All right. That's what's great about this show. You find out about stocks you never knew about. I tell you, I have learned symbols that I never knew. I actually, okay. This does have the look of a flag. You know, just at first glance, I can kind of see a bull flag developing here. I don't like the fact when I look at my PMO, and the PMO can certainly be used uh, for divergences, uh, for overbought, oversold. 
And, you know, I've got a really flat PMO. I have really, uh, to me, with looking at these tops, I'm pointing this out and I'm not annotating as I go, which is the whole point. Uh, it is quite a negative divergence here. I liked your advice, though. And that was that when you're in a big uptrend uh, and you see these negative divergences, you know, not to get, you know, you're you, not to get overly concerned about it. And uh, seeing this flag here, I really like that. Um, let's see, I'm going to change these colors just so it's clear what I was looking at. Well, move it to red. Oh, well, it's not working. Uh, but you've got a nice strong scooter and you've got this, uh, what I would call a bullish pattern. So I I would set my stop probably, you can see that's a pretty good area of support here at 48 that it's bouncing off of. Uh, but I would hope for that consolidation zone to end, get the flag to execute. So for me, uh, if the flag started to fall apart, that would be my my notice. Uh, the 20 day EMA, I think, is pretty good support. But I would probably go, uh, you know, if it's a short term trade, I would look at that 4750 area where we really break down below this, what should be fairly strong resistance, bust the pattern. Um, you know, I'd be looking for a pretty sharp decline if, as far as setting my stop, if that makes any sense. But if uh, at this point, everything looks very bullish on that chart. So it's hard to get it. Uh, get too bearish next okay one. the next one would be ferrari race all right i like that i'd like to own a ferrari one day i think but i'd need a, uh, a another car that was certainly more uh, drivable for me stock is cheaper yeah you know it's that's right i can own ferrari that way <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's get the auto support resistance going here because I think that, uh, you know, you could make a case for this level and I'm going to even put that in, but I'm going to make that a little bit lighter and we're going to put this one in because I think that's going to be, that's probably your stop level really when you're looking at this. But I, you know, I really, I could see after this long move, we could be looking at a head and shoulders, you know, head, left, uh, left shoulder, um, possibly right shoulder. And there you go with your uh, neckline. We did break below it. So now we're starting to head up to that neckline and we're not quite getting above it. I just see the 20 day crossing below the 50 day. That gives me uh, an intermediate term trend model neutral signal. So I'm not really liking that. Uh, so I think the pattern is a possibility. I'm going to use a different color for those arrows. Let's see, put one in there, make that blue so i would be a little bit concerned however comma look at the pmo it's really oversold uh i'm i'm liking the look of that so but i honestly i think what i would do to make sure it's oversold is do a long-term daily chart because that's really where you're going to find that out so for example we'll just make this five years and see how oversold that really is fairly oversold we're hitting lows we haven't seen uh, since it started off. So very oversold. I would just be a little concerned, as you can see, with that possible head and shoulders developing. Uh, we want to see price get above that 107 level. All righty. All right. Next, we got two from the energy sector, Noble Drilling, NE. All right. Ah, all right. This has some interesting annotation possibilities. All right. So I honestly would look at this and I think that kind of lines up there and that, and that is an ascending triangle and that is a bullish pattern. Uh, I'm not liking really the, the setup of the PMO. You have a 50 below the 200. So you're kind of banking on the fact that, okay, we're, we're done um, with this, uh, decline. We we did see the 50 starting to turn up, um, but I would be a little concerned because I do have this negative divergence. And let's get this in here on the PMO. But I'm going to make that red. Why would it change colors for me? Oh, you know, let's try it that way. There we go. Usually I can get it to work the other way too. But you know, it's not that much of a negative divergence because we're looking again at sort of a flat 
amount these tops are really flat in comparison so not a hugely bad uh negative divergence you know the volume is starting to the obv is starting to pick up here um i would be watching that four dollar level and because because if i got a breakdown from a, a bullish pattern uh i would i would certainly um consider that even more bearish but where is our our support for if we end up with a really bad correction it's all the way down here to that three dollar level so you know if i was if i owned it and of course uh, being a lower um uh the stock being a lower price you know the volatility the percent changes uh, can be rather difficult to to handle so you have to come in already knowing that you've got some serious volatility and your stops are going to probably require a, a larger percentage down if we're setting them for the short term. So yeah, in this, in this case, I'd be watching that $4 level fairly closely. And this area of support, near term support would probably be where I'd put a stop. But it's a fifth, the 50 is below the 200. I, you know, I, I just don't buy stocks that are that way, even if we're starting to see that uh, turnaround. I, like we did right here. It's just not enough to really entice me. But it's amazing with oil moving up since what the middle latter part of August. Right. This one is still below its September high. Right. And it's just moving sideways. So again, mm -hmm. that is a, a good clue as well that, you know, if you want to be in this space, probably not the stock to be in. Yeah. And the other one is Apache APA. Okay. Um, I think it's got a similar kind of triangle working. Yes. Or maybe it's... Yeah. Or at least a trading range for sure. Let's take it's that look. support though. Yes. So, I mean, there's, you know, it could go a little bit lower down to here, but I think that's uh, yeah, it's hitting support. I like that. And yeah, I would look at this as a trading range. Um, you know, if you did draw uh, a rising bottoms trend line here, you'd get, positive you know to me this is a, a good setup regardless of the pattern just because it is hitting that support level but i would be a little bit hesitant here i think uh if you want to get in again there are better stocks in this space in my opinion but if you really wanted to give this one a try it's in a pretty solid trading range it's been in it since you know september october when it it uh formed it's been pretty regular on its trips down and its trips back up. Uh, so, you know, I would uh, consider it and, and look for that move up to that overhead resistance like it has been doing over the past few months and set that stop down here below that uh, level, that low we see over here. Okay. I don't know what number we're on, so I'm gonna have. All to right. <laughs> yeah. How about one? How about one more? We'll okay. do uh, CAI. That is uh, CAI International. Okay. There we go. Wow. It'd be a transportation. It's a transportation service. Mm hmm Okay. That I. Mm. All right. Well, let's look at our support resistance. So, that is an area that was support, I would say, on this move down, and it got broken. The next level, you know, you're looking at these lows over here, you could probably drag it down a little bit, yeah, and share some of these tops with those uh, lows. At 25, you know, I, I don't like the looks, of, I, I think if you're looking to bottom feed, um, I would wanna see this go and test that 200 day EMA. I would leave this alone. Uh, you know, you've got the PMO, it's still declining. It's now below the zero line. And we have not seen that in a whole year. And, you know, as soon as you see a PMO go below the zero line, that's telling you that in the uh, intermediate to long term, there's some there's some serious problems here with momentum. And, you know, look at this OBV is on the, the decline. This was a very hot stock for a long time. And of course, it, it makes sense as far as uh, among its peers, it was rallying very nicely. Uh, but the scooter is starting to fall off a little bit along with that OBV. I'd be waiting on this one. 
I, I don't think I would jump in at this point. We're look, you know, it's that falling knife. Look at the 20. It's crossed below the 50 day EMA. That gives me a uh, IT trend model neutral. Uh, so nothing here that I could be really interested in. And there we go. All okay. Right. Well, we have some time now to go over to our what would you do segment. And the question is, I'm going to give you that stock, if you recall, what would you do? The, the answers are either buy and hold, buy or hold it, sell or short it, or just simply leave it alone. And so the symbol we are going to do is Ecolab, if you recall, E-C-L. So feel free to go check it out uh, and then give us your thoughts in the live chat box. Just say E-C-L and then tell us your vote. Buy, hold, sell short, leave it alone. Uh, and I'll keep an eye on that and we'll kind of tally up what we're seeing, see what uh, we agree with or disagree with. So I'm going to um, call it up. I've, I'd already put it in here. And I would want, uh, Arthur will give you his opinion on his chart style. So I suspect you can get that all together, Arthur. And I will give you my perspective uh, based on the DP analysis. I thought this one was pretty ambiguous. So I picked it so that we would really see a difference of opinions uh, because I think uh, when you look at this chart, it's ambiguous. I think you can make a case for a lot of different ways to look at this. So go ahead and take a look at it, guys, and ECL, and start throwing your notes in there in the live chat box. Again, if you could put ECL and then your vote, which is buy, buy hold, sell short, and uh, leave it alone. So let me give you my share with ECL on it. And here you go. Like I said, I it's it's an ambiguous chart. So I'm going to give you a little bit of time on this to let me know what you think of ECL. And uh, Arthur, I, I don't know. Are you have you uh, grabbed it and have you look? I do have it up, and I would say buy. Okay. You want to annotate your chart, and then uh, you can tell us why you would go that direction. And go ahead and steal the screen. That's a, a great thing to do. So. Okay, I will steal the screen. And yeah, so this it is an exercise. I just so everybody knows we're not going to I mean, at least for me, I'm not going to, you know, go out and and just buy something or or, you know, short it just because we did a what would you do? This is a, an educational exercise. So I'm just going to preface it that way. Uh, whenever we look at these. So, and here we go, Arthur, give us your... Uh... Well, what I'm going to do is is um, some of those uh, companies that were asked in the 10, of, 10 for 10, I needed to use the full quote to find out what they did. Mm -hmm. uh, and when you click that box and update, we can see we have materials, specialty chemicals. And the materials sector is one of the strongest sectors there is. So that is going for it. Uh, we're in a bull market. That is going for it. Uh, as far as, you know, being on the long side. Had a 52-week high here. And I'll put on the annotate. And you can see what would be a resistance zone and turning into a support zone. So we've had a breakout and a throwback. And now we're testing this breakout zone. And I could put on the Fibonacci's and you can see that it's about a 50% retracement roughly so far, which is fairly normal if you're doing two steps forward and one step backward uh, type of thing here. And I will put on, somebody asked me if I use candlesticks. And that's a good question because, you know, I used to use them quite a bit, uh, but then I kind of decided to limit my use. In other words, I was qualifying my use of candlesticks. 
and I'd only use them. Uh, oh yeah, we're live on the air. There I would you only go. use them in an uptrend. I would only use bullish candlesticks in an uptrend and I would ignore bearish candlesticks when the trend is up. So if I back this out and I go six months to candlesticks, it means I would be aware of bullish candlesticks on this chart because I'm only interested in long positions. So we have a nice hammer here at 134, 135. We didn't get follow through because we fell back today. Uh, but I think, you know, we're at support and this is a good spot uh, for a bounce. And as far as a trade, you move below the low of the candlestick, you can be out It's a, and then reevaluate. But, you know, once it goes below that 50 day, you have another setup again for the mean reversion type uh, of trade. So, I, you know, I think it's a pullback within an uptrend and I would expect it to be hitting new highs in a month or two. All right. Excellent. Okay, uh, next. <laughs> my turn. Okay, and just uh, so everybody knows, um, I've been pretty much uh, taking notes of what everybody uh, has been putting. Definitely a skew toward uh, the buy. Right now I've got about 10 people on a buy, two people who would sell or short it, and about six who just would leave it alone or just wait on that. So I'm going to pull up mine. I just got to share my screen properly. Okay. All right. So there are a couple of problems with this, but there are a lot of positives about this. So I'm going to annotate it and then I'll give you my, my underlying opinion as to what I would do. So I think you, uh, similar thoughts, Arthur, I'm sure I'm going to be repeating myself, uh, repeating a lot of what you said. Uh, look at this trading zone. Okay. We finally broke out of, out of it. Uh, and now we we're starting to pull back after making these highs. The PMO is a little bit worrisome, right? Cause we have this top and it is declining. However, I do like the fact that we're seeing those tops rising in conjunction with the tops that are rising here. So I think that gives you a, a bit of more of a positive, uh, skew on this. The, you know, the scooter has been rather flat. And so, you know, that that's a plus or a minus. But the main thing is, is it hasn't been uh, in the basement. So I, I think that I could forgive that. Um, I, I agree with the possibility of a flag going on here. And let's pick a color we haven't picked yet. Ooh, pink. There we go. And yeah, there we go with that flag. It's bouncing off that support area. I've got nicely set up trend model. Five is above the 20. 20 is above the 50. 50 is above the 200. So all of those look good. Look at the margin between the 50 and the 200. This has been in a nice uh, bull market configuration for quite a while. Uh, all the way back, you know, we got that in a, the 50 crossed above that 200 a while back. So I, despite seeing this turnover of the PMO, I would still buy this. And the main thing I could say about this PMO, because everybody's like, oh, you would never do that. No, here's the deal. And I'm going to put this here. I would assume that I would have gotten in before this because I would have had the, the buy signal here. I'd had the buy signal and oversold territory. I'd have been watching this OBV coming out of it. I would probably be already in it uh, on the buy side. And so when I'm, I use the PMO as a candidate tracker who, where I can find the good momentum, what's going on. And then I use it as information after that. So it's information. Yes, we're seeing this, uh, turning over PMO, but the top is higher than the previous top. I wouldn't get so worried to the point where I feel like I needed to sell, especially given the fact that all my trend models look pretty good. Short term, certainly some concern, right? We've gone below the five day EMA. It looks like it's getting ready to cross below the 20. That would give me a short term trend model neutral. Um, but at that point, I think, you know, you would have lost that support level. So you more than likely would have already hit, 
hit a stop. I would have said it, you know, in a short term trade. Like I said, I like to have a little bit tighter stops um, just because I'm in it for the short term. I've set my target. If it goes below anything about, you know, that much further than where I entered, you know, it's not doing what I expected it to do. So I, I don't need to stay in it. Uh, I'd rather go find something better. So if I got a breakdown, not only below that support level, but below 133 at that 50 day EMA, uh, I would, that's when I would likely uh, sell it. But right now, I think you could uh, justify a buy here with no problem. And if this truly is a flag, you know, you can measure uh, the height of this flag. And that's how much uh, you should expect the uh, minimum upside target to be because you take the length of the flagpole, you add it to the top of the flag breakout and then bring it up. And so with a, a flagpole that is, you know, anyway, at least between one, you know, eight, um, eight dollars at least, uh, then you can expect that move when you get that breakout, uh, you know, closer to like a, a 144 or somewhere in that uh, range. So I like One thing, uh, uh, people are mentioning a shooting star today. Oh, yeah, let's go ahead. And, and I wanted to comment on that. A, a shooting star is a bearish reversal pattern. And in order to be a bearish reversal pattern, you have to have a uptrend to reverse. And there is no short term uptrend in this stock. It's a short term downtrend. If you count, you know, we're down eight days or seven days. So you can't have a shooting star when the short term trend is down because candlesticks yeah. are short term patterns. Exactly. Uh, so that's, you know, the hammer is possible because you have a short term downtrend. Um, but the shooting star is, is not, it's just a non event really. Right. And but that Aaron points out, if you get above the high of today's candlestick, that's going to be a flag breakout. Exactly. And that, you know, and then, you know, calculate that uh, upside target. I love flags. I mean, they're continuation patterns. Uh, we're in a bull market configuration, uh, you know, bullish configuration with a 50 above the 200. So I think you can make a pretty good case uh, for this one. I would just, this is the only thing that would maybe give me pause. But like I said, I'd have probably been in sooner. This would have been brought to my attention sooner through my scan. Uh, so I this would be information which would tell me, hey, keep an eye on this just to make sure it it uh, doesn't really catch uh, this negative momentum doesn't catch fire. And there is, you know, you you have to have a little concern when you look at an OBV that's uh, declined that much with a lot of selling here in the volume. So excellent. This has been so much fun, Arthur, I have to tell yeah, you. Yeah, yeah. Went good. Yeah, I think, you know, for Arthur and I, we have sort of a different um, look at the markets. I know we, t we tend to be a little bit more on the, you know, technical, um, the technical side of things, you know, really looking at the, the patterns and all, all of that. Tom really has a lot of, he's, he is really, he is a trader. I mean, that's why he writes his blog, Trading Places. So he has a, you know, he helps all of our viewers understand how to trade using these candlesticks in the short term and using fundamentals. And um, so I think it's great. It was a lot of fun to have you here because we do have sort of a, the same perspective on a lot of, uh, you know, analysis in general. So. Well, yeah. I'm all for pure technicals. <laughs> <laughs> all righty. Let's see here. We, I think we have a time for at least one or two questions. And I did have one for you that didn't, uh, end up getting answered uh, right away. So let's go ahead and uh, just move over to our mailbag and, and wrap up. I uh, had the question about Arun uh, crossovers and whether you consider those valid signals. So I don't know if you want to grab the screen maybe and, and look at that, um, or is it a quick answer? Yes or sure, no? Sure, <laughs> I'll, I'll grab the screen and give it a look. Uh, the thing about the Aruns is um, I think they're kind of a, a breakout trend following type indicator. Um, so they're going to be prone to whipsaws. 
And so let me just grab this screen here. Grab the wrong one. All right, now we should be on my Chrome desktop. And I'll pull up a chart. Uh, somebody else asked about um, inflation in gold. And so I just pulled up this chart here of gold and the tip IEF ratio. I just want to touch on this real quick. Um, so you can see there's a positive correlation, fairly positive. But look at this. TIP was outperforming IEF and gold went down. So it's not as strong as you might think, that correlation. And Whenever you hear about something, try to chart it and try to see it for yourself. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Yeah, I know. So let's, yeah. Yeah, I just, as a way, I always say, you know, whenever you get, you know, you do your scans and you get this set up, uh, you know, in the scan, I have signals. You have to look at the chart. I mean, before you do anything, and I think everybody here, if you're on stock charts, you're here to look at the chart. <laughs> so. so here's the Arun. Um, I typically use 20 days, um, which is four weeks. And you can see if you just use the crosses, sometimes you're going to get some whipsaws. Uh, you know, if you get a cross below 50, um, so there's kind of like three steps to an Arun signal, if you will. One is the cross, and then two is the move above 50. So if you get a cross above, like Arun up crosses above Arun down right there in May. All right, that's the first step. Above 50 is the second step. And then when it hits 100, according to Tushar Chan, who is a columnist for us, a uh, uh, you can always ask him, too, because he's the creator of the Arun Oscillator. It means dawn's early light in Sanskrit. Um, but when it hits 100, that's the sign that a new trend is starting. And you can see a new trend started here. But then we got this sharp decline, and we got a new downtrend. And again, it was a bit of a whipsaw. But then you caught a fairly good one here. So it can be kind of a whippy indicator if you don't get an extended trend like you did here from January until um, April, maybe, you know, into May, if you will. Um, so that's the thing about the Arun Oscillator. You need a good trend to make it work. Got it. I think that was a great question. Uh, let's see. I, I also had a quick, I don't know if it's a quick question, so maybe I shouldn't ask it. So um, just maybe don't uh, elaborate too much. <laughs> um, have, you, have you designed uh, uh, some scanning strategies that you find work? I mean, I have my PMO scan that I pretty much uh, rely completely on to, to get my uh, candidates. Uh, are there any scans in particular that you find uh, work best for you? Well, I, 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 yeah, it is too uh, short to get into uh, much detail, but, you know, the basics of one of my scans is going to be the 50-day EMA above the 200-day EMA. I'm going to want to see that, you know, it's in the top uh, 20, 30 percent of performers in the S&P 500, uh, maybe with a scooter that's above 70 and then look for RSI, 10 period RSI to be around 30. So you've had a pullback. I like those kind of scans, mm -hmm. looking for a pullback within an uptrend. Awesome. Is there, have you done some articles that maybe they can look up on some of your scans? Yes. Uh, if you um, look at the system trader articles, uh, they will typically have some scan code in them. And also, if you go to the article on in the chart school on RSI or MACD, uh, there's some scan code included at the bottom of those articles as well. All right. Well, it's time to wrap it up. And again, I just absolutely loved having you here uh, to chat. Uh, a couple of announcements. Remember that uh, Tom will be back on Friday to do his workshop on price support and resistance. And Wednesday, Greg Schnell will be here to do his uh, point and figure review. So 
we don't talk about point and figure a lot. That would be, it's a great chance to, to really learn a little bit more about it. And so in closing, I want to thank you very much for joining us today, Arthur, and everybody else and our viewers. If you could complete that survey when you exit the show, the how do we do, it'll be in the bottom. Uh, it'll be on the left side, uh, on the right. Uh, we really do appreciate your comments, and we really do use them read every single one of them uh, to help us shape future shows uh, for questions and that sort of thing. Uh, as a reminder, Market Watchers Live airs Monday through Friday from noon to 1.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Have a great day, everyone, and happy trading.